Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the live streaming worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. I'm Grace Price, a member of the worship committee, and I will be one of your worship associates today. You will also hear the voices of Dinah Rowe and Adam Reiki. We invite you to worship with us with an open mind and an open heart. As we enter into sacred time, created by our presence and shared intent, I invite you to get comfortable. Turn down your phones or other distracting devices. Make a conscious decision to set aside for this one hour the self-protective walls we keep around our hearts and our thoughts. Let us remember and explore together what has drawn us to this faith or learn what this faith is about. Let the stresses of the outside world slip away as we focus on this shared time. And together, we breathe. Whether we have been part of this UUCR community by electronic means, or only connected in our hearts over this long year, we are still that unique collection of compassionate wanderers, seekers, and doers that make up this beloved community. As we gather here today, let go of the anxiety, the fears, the expectations of your own or others' making, and join us in this hour of beloved community. And together, through the quiet power of community, we move. Our opening hymn this morning is, I've Got Peace Like a River. Please rise in spirit and join us. And because we are zooming this, nobody will know if we sing off key. Our 
call to worship, I invite you to read with me the mission statement of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. We are still in March, and this is Women's History Month, so we have a few examples of um, some heroines in our history. Shirley Anita Chisholm was an American politician, educator, and author. In 1968, she became the first Black woman elected to the United States Congress, representing New York's 12th Congressional District for seven terms from 1969 to 1983. In the 1972 United States presidential election, she became the first African-American candidate for a major party's nomination for president of the United States and the first woman to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. Born in Brooklyn, Chisholm studied and worked in early childhood education, becoming involved in local Democratic Party politics in the 1950s. In 1964, Overcoming some resistance because she was a woman, she was elected to the New York State Assembly. Four years later, she was elected to Congress, where she led expansion of food and nutrition programs for the poor and rose to party leadership. She retired from Congress in 1983 and taught at Mount Holyoke College while continuing her political organizing. Although nominated for an ambassadorship in 1993, health issues caused her to withdraw. In 2015, Chisholm was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Her quote, service is the rent we pay for the privilege of living on this earth. Mm -hmm. Deborah Ann Hillen was born December 2nd, 1960. She is an American politician serving as the 54th United States Secretary of the Interior. A member of the Democratic Party, she served as chair of the New Mexico Democratic Party from 2015 to 2017, and as a U.S. representative for New Mexico's first congressional district from 2019 to 2021. Along with Cherise Davids, she is one of the first two Native American women elected to the U.S. Congress. Kaylin is an enrolled member of the Laguna Pueblo. She is a political progressive who supports the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. On December 17, 2020, President Joe Biden announced that he would nominate Helen to serve as Secretary of the Interior. She was confirmed by the United States Senate on March 15, 2021, by a vote of 51 to 40. Following her swearing in on March 16, 2021, she became the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary. Her quote, we don't have time to play politics with people's lives or the planet's future. Kathy Nichols is no stranger to UUCR. In the past, she was usually with us in a supportive role as the other half of Joan and Kathy. But recently, she has assumed a new role with us as speaker. Kathy holds a bachelor's degree in art and music history from Syracuse University and a master's of public administration in urban and community planning. She is currently living in Worcester, <laughs> Massachusetts with Joan Gardens, her partner of 27 years, and Finley, their new Carnegie Welsh Pogito. About her sermon, Kathy said, in the third presentation in our exploration of compassion and why our culture needs it, we will explore why some cultures have it and some do not. Why a lack of compassion impacts all things in the society. We will also consider why silos are dysfunctional behavior, as is a lack of compassion, and how these elements fit into racism. And finally, we will look at how the breakdown of silos are giving rise to compassionate systems. There are a few announcements we would like to share. 
During the service, we will mention several website and email addresses and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up the slide with all this information. It is available on our website. However, for those needing the information by auditory means, they will be announced verbally during the service. Chat time provides an opportunity to spend an hour talking among ourselves, usually beginning with the service, then wandering on to other topics. It's held on Zoom at 11.30. But to participate, you need a separate Zoom room. So please go to our website at uuchurchofriverside.org for the Zoom chat time room. All right, all right, all right. Wait, wait one second. Well, so next week, um, hello, Adam Blanton, the social justice uh, chair. Next week would normally be our social justice committee meeting, but it's Easter, so we're going to go ahead and just wait till the next week, or till, till the third week uh, of uh, April. Last I said. Um, also coming up though is this ACLU uh, California Action Conference that's happening over the second and third weeks of April. Um, the uh, the first week, I don't know if it's on there, but the, the, the second week of April will be conferences um, and um, workshops. The third week will be actual visits with our legislators to talk about um, the issues that ACLU is working on. Um, there's going to be some lessons or trainings on how to do legislative meetings, and then you'll join people who are in your district for a meeting. Um, I have signed up to lead some meetings, so um, if you're you know, in, in uh, Richard Ross district or Sabrina Cervantes district, you're right there and invite her with our legislators. But it looks really great. Um, you can go on the webpage, uh, uuchurchriverside.org, click on justice, click on social environmental justice. Where it says take action, um, you look for that logo there, ACLU uh, California Action logo, and there's information there, a link there to register. Um, tells you what all the events are because there's a number of events over those two weeks. So you get that all on your calendar. Right, and that's it for social justice. Thank you, Adam. Now on to the coronavirus news. There is progress being made. There are many vaccination appointments available right now. The official website still indicates they are for those age 65 or over, those with certain medical conditions and specific workforce categories. So for information on locations near you, go to vaccineca.com or go to the website for your county public health department or the state of California. You can also find information and links on our church website. Vaccinations are opening for all Californians aged 50 and up on April 1st and 16 and up on April 15th. The state is expanding who is eligible to get the vaccine based on expected supply increases. It will still take months to get every Californian vaccinated who wants to be but millions are being vaccinated each week. Sign up at myturn.ca.gov or call 833-422-4255 to find out if it's your turn. If you're eligible, you can schedule an appointment or register to be notified when one is available. In California, over 17 million vaccines have been administered and nearly 781,000 of them are in Riverside County. Vaccinations are administered at an average clip of 2.5 million per day. We are so close to getting control over this pandemic. Please urge everyone you know to be patient and be safe just a little longer. UUCR is making plans to be able to safely open our doors for Sunday service beginning on Easter, April 4th. Stay tuned for more information. The monthly UUCI newsletter 
comes out the first of every month by email and per request by postal mail. If you have something you would like covered or that you want to write, let Dinah know at ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com or call or text her at 909-645-2885. If you haven't received a newsletter and would like to be added to our mailing list, please contact Dinah or the church office. On the first Sunday of each month, we share with you the joys and concerns that we have received throughout the month. A Swedish proverb says, shared joy is a noble joy. Shared sorrow is half sorrow. Next week is a significant week in many respects. UUCR will be reopening its doors for the first time since March 2020. It would be an especially fitting time to share our joys and concerns, considering all the things that we have experienced individually and collectively in the past year. We are interested in hearing from all the members of the community who have something to share and invite you to do so next Sunday on April 4th. Please email your text or email, please email or text your joys and concerns as they occur to you throughout the month to our caring network coordinator, Dinah Rowe. We have two items of sacred flame. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Permit. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. Let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Moranga, the original people of this land, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. In honor of the Moranga people, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the source of the sacred and holy place. We are blessed with the space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily life, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey in worship today. The International Council of Unitarian Universalists, or ICUU, distributes a new chalice lighting reading each month. Congregations worldwide are invited to use the reading for at least one worship service in the designated month. Today's reading, slightly adapted, is the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists chalice lighting reading for March. They were written by Reverend Steve Dick former executive director of the ICU. They are offered here in honor of his life and his passionate dedication to our global faith community. The light of the sun does not lift the shadows that have fallen on humanity the world over. We relight our chalice flame to reignite a spirit of radical optimism, knowing it takes us all living what matters to dispel those who would divide us. All manner of things will be well if we make them well. May our free religious communities embody the right relationships our world so desperately needs. Our next hymn is Spirit of Life. Please rise in spirit and join us.
Sure. Good morning. I'm Dinah Rowe, our church treasurer. I'm going to speak to you about sharing our treasure. This portion of our service is about funding all that we do to care for our congregation and our beloved historic church. When we are in person at the church, this is when the ushers pass the collection plate. At this time, there are several ways you can contribute. You may mail your donations and pledge to the church office or scan the QR code with your phone. This QR code is shown on the website and in the newsletter. The church address is shown here. A reminder that our necessary ongoing church expenses continue. Our administrator, Robert, pays the bills and answers inquiries to the church plus other items which come up on a daily basis. We're really excited about reopening next Sunday, April 4th, so we can all be together again in person and continue with our activities. Please do your part by contributing what you can. A reminder that the annual pledge drive is underway. Please turn in your pledge form as soon as possible, as this is how we plan the budget for the fiscal year, which begins in July. There's going to be a, a drawing for a gift basket the first Sunday in May for those who turn in their pledge form. And a reminder that we have Stater Brothers gift cards for your grocery shopping that also earns our church a percentage. Please contact me or the church office to purchase Stater Brothers cards. Again, my email and the church office email is shown here. Please donate by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to all those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Our next hymn is from you I receive. Please rise again in spirit and join us.
when we experience the full presence of each other because of our shared humanity, because of our differences, that is where holy gratitude begins. May this space be a table that is not complete until all are welcome. May this table be a space of beauty where together we create a series of miracles in where all that we share is sacred. May it be so. Now, let us enter into a moment of silence together. Now we'd like to invite Kathy Nichols to give her service on compassion number three, what does silence have to do with racism? Good morning. Um, welcome everybody. Um, this is the uh, last in the um, th and third presentation in our exploration of compassion and why our culture needs it, why some cultures have it and some do not, why a lack of compassion impacts all things in a society, why so silos are dysfunctional behavior as, it, as is lack of compassion and how these elements fit into racism and how the breakdown of silos are giving rise to compassionate systems. Good morning and thank you all for joining me. Um, um, it turns out that uh, intersectionality of compassion and where it has led us up to this point is um, part of what we're exploring. Um, so we'll start off with uh, definition, put silos in context and um, the, uh, the definitions. Um, I'm using the um, um, business organizational uh, definition for silos because it, um, it the, defin the explanation of what a silo was, um, uh, was a better, uh, a more accurate metaphor for how I was looking at this. So a silo is um, systems are unable to operate with any other systems. And that's from the British Psychological Society. And then this one is from um, Investopedia. The word silo originally referred to storage containers for grain or missiles, but it is now used as a metaphor for separate entities that stockpile information and effectively seal it in. Excuse me.
in business organizations, in business organizational silo, silos refer to business divisions that operate independently and avoid sharing information. No matter what the reasons are, um, reasons for it are, a silo mentality exists because senior management allows it to exist. A silo mentality inevit inevitably damages morale, especially when employees become aware of the problem and are unable to do anything to change it. Attitudes are different, uh, are difficult to change, especially when self-interest is at stake. A writer for Salesforce, remember this is from um, Investopedia, Investopedia um, suggest that the keys to dismantling silos are cooperation, communication, and collaboration. Um, as we go through, you will probably see these different, if not the words, the, um, the, uh, the, the um, action, cooperation, communication, and collaboration show up frequently in, um, in what we're talking about today. Um, then we go into uh, intersectionality. Um, intersectionality is simply about how certain aspects of who you are will increase your access to the good things or your exposure to the bad things in life. Like many other social justice ideas, it stands because it resonates with people's lives, but because it resonates with people's lives, of course, it's under attack. Um, Kimberly uh, Crenshaw, uh, the law professor at Columbia and UCLA, uh, coined the um, term intersectionality more than 30 years ago. Um, so I thought that this would be prescient now. Um, this interview with Katie Steinmetz um, was done in February 20th, 2020. So, <clears throat> Um, so she coined the term intersectionality to describe the way people's social identities can overlap. Um, and talks about its lasting relevance, why all inequality is not quite equal. So the first question that Katie asked uh, Ms. Crenshaw um, you introduced intersectionality more than 30 years ago. How do you explain what it means today? These days I start with what it's not because there has been distortion. It's not identity politics on steroids. It's not a mechanism to turn white men into the new pariahs. It's basically a lens, a prison, for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exasperate, but exasperate, I always can't say that, but anyway, okay, get the, get the idea on that one. Each other, we tend to talk about race, inequality as separate from inequality based on gender, class, sexuality, or immigrant status, or other identities such as ableism and, um, and um, ageism. So what's often missing is how some people are subject to all of these and the experience is not just the sum of its parts. Next question, how do women experience inequality differently than men? Where do we see that in our daily lives? When, when we talk about inequality, we are often talking about material differences in conditions of life. Take income inequality. Numerous statistics show that women still get paid less for the same work. That multiplies over a lifetime and means that the problem gets worse the older women get. There's also a, team, a term called the feminization 
of poverty, which speaks to all the ways that life circumstances like child rearing, divorce, illness, um, impact women more profoundly. Across the social plane, from issue to issue, from institution to institution, you see women doing, on average, more poorly than men. Next question. How does race affect the, that picture? When you add on top of, of that other inequality producing structures like race, you have a compounding. So for example, data show that white women's medium, median wealth is somewhere in the 40,000 range. Black, women, black women's is $100. Question, where do you see politics coming into play? The issues that concern women are often afterthoughts. Even the Democrats' approach, approach to a racial inequality is focused primarily on men and boys. Anything that's meant to address gender inequality has to include, excuse me, <clears throat> Sorry about that. I think it's slowly going down. Um, anything that's meant to address gender inequality has to include a racial lens. And anything that's meant to address racial inequality has to include a gender lens. Unfortunately, that's meant to address that's meant to address gender inequality has to include a racial lens. And anything that's meant to address racial inequality has to include a gender lens. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the center, that has, hasn't been the center of political and policy debate. Question, why not? The image of the citizen is still a male citizen. When you get to a few gender topics like reproductive rights, then we talk about women. But politics and policy are pretty much like medicine used to be and still is. The male body is the body. Question, what do you make of criticisms from conservatives that concepts like intersectionality are a means of fetishize, fetish, fetishizing victimization? that the left interprets disadvantages as a kind of moral superior, superior, superiority. Answer, intersectionality is simply about how certain aspects of who you are will increase your access to the good things or your exposure to the bad things in life. Like many other social justice ideas, it stands because it resonates with people's lives. But because it resonates with people's lives, it's under attack. There's nothing new about defenders of the status quo criticizing those who are demanding that injustices are addressed. It's all the, a crisis over a sense that things might actually have to change for equality to be real. Question, what advice would you give the average person about what they can do today to help achieve more equality in America. Self-interrogation is a good place to start. If you see inequality as a them problem or unfortunate other problem, that is a problem. Being able to attend not just unfair exclusion, but also frankly unearned inclusion is part of the equality gambit. We've got to be open to looking at all of the ways our systems it reproduce these inequalities, and that includes the privileges as well as the harms. So um, that, that concludes the, uh, the interview. And um, I picked this other um, um, 
definition of intersectionality because it was um, from Oxford Dictionary um, and it um, was put in there when it started to be used a lot by uh, the women's movement in England. And so it has a kind of a different flavor. And so um, here's the um, Oxford Dictionary um, definition. Put simply, intersectionality is the concept that all oppression is linked. More explicitly, the Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as, quote, the interconnected nature of social categ categorizations such as race, class, and gender regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Intersectionality is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression, and we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people, gender, race, class, sexual orientations, physical ability, etc. First coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, Back in 1989, intersectionality was added to the Oxford Dish Dictionary in 2015 with its importance increasingly being recognized in the world of women's rights. So there we have some of the issues of, the, of silos, um, which is, you know, um, um, keeping information um, separate from um, the people that um, are not using the silos and um, and intersectional intersectionality so um, those are the issues and and I found this um, which I thought would be helpful using an anti-racist intersectional frame and this is at this, uh, used by the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Um, that way we start to have tools uh, to be able to affect change instead of just saying, we've got these things and I don't know what to do about it. So um, we have definitions then. Uh, central to using a frame, is developing a shared language. The following breaks down individual concepts as a means to better understand what an anti-racist intersectional frame entails. Anti-racism is the active process of identifying and challenging racism by changing systems, organizational structures, policies and practices, and attitudes to redistribute power in an equitable manner. Anti-black racism is any attitude, any attitude behavior, practice, or policy that explicitly or implicitly reflects the belief that black people are inferior to another racial group. Anti-black racism is reflected in interpersonal, institutional, and systemic levels of racism such as, and is a function of white supremacy. A racist idea is any concept that regards one racial group as inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. They also have a definition for um, intersectionality. Intersectionality is a concept and a frame coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 to describe the ways in which race, class, gender, and other aspects of our identity intersect, overlap, and interact with one another, informing the way in which individuals simultaneously experience oppression and privilege in their daily lives. 
Interpersonally and systemically, intersectionality promotes the idea that aspects of our identity do not work in a silo. Intersectionality then provides a basis for understanding how these individual identity markers work with one another. And then the second part of this um, is the um, how to use the uh, inter the the intersectionality frame. Upper 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 <laughs> sorry operationalizing anti-racism, anti-black racism, racist ideas, and intersectionality. The anti-racist intersectional theme recognizes all the different ways people and communities experience racism with respect to their identities. This anti-racist frame also recognizes that racism in the United States is grounded in and motivated by anti-black racism. Okay, so the anti-racist inter intersectional frame. Bullet point, recognizes the social effects of racism that omitting a racial analysis from any work allows racist systems, laws, and policies to continue operating within the status quo. The frame requires that work centers a racial analysis. Bullet point, requires an understanding that the impact of racial oppression is not fully realized without interrogating the intersections of all forms of oppression. Oppression based on SOGI, S-O-G-I-E, which is sexual orientation, gender ID, and expression. Uh, class, immigration status, and ability. The frame that requires exploration and analysis of how other others forms other forms of oppression are in, intertwined with and complicated by racial oppression bullet point calls out white supremacy and white privilege understanding the historical role of the enslavement of black people and colonization and genocide of native and indigenous people the frame recognizes that historical violence has created a modern reservoir of power for white people and institutions. The frame also uses historical understanding to examine racial and ethnic groups relate relationship to power given their proximity to whiteness and white privilege. Bullet point. Centralizes an appreciation of the human experience, recognizing the importance of individuals and community social, cultural, political, ecological, and spiritual identities. Bullet point. Takes a critical approach to the development of racial identity, specifically of blackness and whiteness. The frame recognizes that anti-black ideas depict individual black person's actions as representative of the race, while whiteness is neutral and allowed the diversity of experience. Bullet point, questions the motivations of traditional institutions, acknowledging institutions role in distributing and maintaining oppression based on identity. The frame asks anti-racist work to, to be critical of social and political institutions and systems. Bullet point, does not divorce issues affecting hi historically marginalized communities from the social, political, and material conditions in which they exist. The frame rejects pathological explanations of behaviors and outcomes because such ex explanations mask the role institutional structures play in affecting outcomes. We've seen quite a bit of that type of thing happening lately, uh, just within the last couple of weeks. Okay. So, the next thing 
Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce, if, uh, if this is new to some people, is um, we talk, I, I, I said that, you know, the, that all of these things affect um, everything in society. So it also affects uh, the economy and how much money we have to spend and what we decide to spend it on. So um, using systems to calculate the cost of wealth um, and accumulation of resources, as we examine this, having more for ourselves means actually less for others. Um, but for the meantime, we'll discuss the process here of the, of the calculation of the GDP. GDP, don't worry, we don't have a lot of math and stuff in here. Uh, for example, if we consider the world GDP, the gross domestic product, um, the um, Institute for Economics and Peace um, do just that in the Global Peace Index. It's published annually, details the cost of violence as measured against the world GD GDP. For the last two years, the economic costs of violence and violence containment comprise about 13.3% and 12% of the GDP, respectively. This averages to about, and this is rather staggering, $13 trillion of the world's annual economic activity for those years. What is pri prioritized, say war or peace, there is a multiplier effect. Resources devoted to violence tend to, um, tend to multiply and strengthen structures of violence, while resources devoted to structures of peace tend to exponentially multiply potential for human flourishing and well-being. What we choose, of course, is a matter of values and priorities. This is where we are, I believe, as individuals, cities, countries, Basically, the whole world, because of this pandemic, pandemic has the opportunity to uh, review values and um, to be able to uh, declare who they are. Now, now the housekeeping which um, takes it, it is a, a follow-up on um, the discussion of uh, studies uh, examining um, how wealth and class um, actually um, uh, affect a person's ability to be able to have compassion and um, and understand poor people. Um, as we heard in the news this last week or so, um, the quote from, I can't remember because I'm keeping track of so many, um, if it was um, Michigan or, or Georgia or Wisconsin, um, but uh, they ha have absolutely no, no tolerance for poor people and they, they just want to not do anything um, as far as um, things that you would do uh, for people to make their life a little bit more um, quality of life better. So, um, so why, why does some people show compassion? 
And there was two studies done by uh, uh, Paul Piff. Uh, one uh, with the title of Having Less, Giving More, The Influence of Class on Pro-Social um, pro -so Behavior. And the other one um, was the higher, uh, that actually the higher of somebody's social class actually can predict unethical behavior. So these are um, actual uh, academic, I think peer reviewed uh, studies. So um, this is kind of what the, the results of these studies are. A body of research is growing that individuals who have much more than others in terms of wealth and status tend to act less ethically and less generously than those who have less. That when wealth increases, empathy tends to decline. Is there a true justif justifiable reason why anybody deserves more than others? that such imbalances are a threat to our integrity. Integrity requires us to hold ourselves to the same standard as others, not exceptions. Compassion requires we recognize and care about the needs of others. Here we can go back to the the silo breaking down as these are some elements that combat the siloed power structures. And that takes care of our, our housekeeping. Yes. And um, after all of this sort of serious, uh, reminder of um, what's wrong, <laughs> but seeing that systems are being developed in order to, for us to have a way to uh, work on those things. Um, I saw this book by uh, Rabbi Michael Lerner, and it really made me feel a lot better. And this is part of uh, a, another system um, that uh, is a way of being, gives us a, uh, another idea of a way of being that's contrary to especially what we've had in the last four years. So it's called Revolutionary Love. I liked that. Um, and like I said, it's by Rabbi Michael Lerner. So I'm just going to read this because I, I just found it, I think, last night. And, um, I didn't have time to read it. So um, from social theorist and psychotherapist, Rabbi Michael Lerner comes, comes a strategy for a new socialism built on love, kindness, and compassion for one another. Revolutionary love proposes a method to replace what Lerner terms the quote, capitalist globalization of selfishness with a globalization of generosity, prophetic empathy, and environmental sanity. Excuse me. Lerner challenges liberal and progressive forces to move beyond often weak need and visionless politics to build instead a movement that can reverse the environmental destructiveness and social injustice caused by the relentless pursuit of economic growth and profits. Revisiting the hidden injuries of class, um, Lerner shows that much of the suffering in our society, including most of its addictions and the growing embrace of right-wing nationalism and re reactionary versions of fundamentalism, is driven by frustrated needs for community, love, respect, and connection to a higher purpose in life. Yet these needs are too often missing from liberal discourse. 
No matter that progressive programs are smartly constructed, they cannot be achieved unless they speak to the heart and address the pain so many people experience. Liberals and progressives need coherent alternatives to capitalism, but previous visions of socialism do not address the yearning for anything beyond material benefits. Inspired by Herbert Marcuse, Eric Fromm, and Carol Gillian, re revolutionary love offers a strategy to create the, care the caring society. Learner details how a civilization in influ see even, even fin Finley thought that was a great idea. Revolutionary love offers offers a strategy to create the caring society. Lerner details how a civilization infused with love could put an end to global poverty, homelessness, and hunger while de democratizing the economy. Shifting to a 28-hour work week and saving the life support system of Earth, he asked that we develop the courage to stop listening to those who tell us that fundamental social transformation is unrealistic. I want to thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak these three months. It's uh, been a privilege and I want to thank you for going on this journey with me and letting me work through this with me uh, to find some answers, some more information and answers. So I want to end this um, presentation um, with a quote that um, I ended another, the first presentation with. Quote, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. As a uh, there was also actually a quote by Gandhi that I wanted to um, put in there uh, and I, I missed saying it. Um, this was for the, the, the greed basically and the GDP. The world has enough for the needs of the people, but it does not have enough for the greed of one person. And as I was saying, uh, somebody that you guys know, this might be something that she might say, go forth and be mighty. A closing hymn is My Life Goes On in the Endless Song.
For our benediction, please close your eyes and reach out to each other in your thoughts. Feel the connection between us, the interconnected web joining us as a community, a church family. Our benediction today is Go in Peace, Seeking Justice by Jim McGough. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go in mindless oblivion. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go without challenging yourself or others. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go in utter ease and comfort. When I say go in peace, I mean go in peace seeking justice. I mean go in peace committed to equal rights and opportunities for all. When I say go in peace, I mean, go in the peace that is created when together we build communities of true solidarity, deep compassion, and fierce, unrelenting love. Go in peace. Amen, shalom, and blessed be. Thank you, Kathy Nichols for sharing your valuable time and insight with all of us at UUCR. It is sincerely appreciated, and we hope you will visit us again. I hope everyone on this live Zoom service can stay with us following the slides for a short period of discussion with our speaker. This will be included on the video that is posted on our Facebook and YouTube platform.
Hi folks. Hi folks. I got to be a visitor this time. It's an echo. Everybody else hearing the echo? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I was wondering how well, there it's gone. I was wondering how well you guys could hear uh, when Grace was talking from the pulpit. Okay. I could hear fine. Who said I couldn't? A little bit, Kathy. I guess it depends on your speakers. I could barely hear her and I couldn't hear a lot of words. I'm going to try picking up a different mic next time. When we used a handheld mic last week, there was a lot of static interference, so. Yeah. Working out the bugs, next week we open our doors and Zoom, so it'll be both. Is there a way to know um, kind of what the sermon or, or topic or speaker is gonna be for next week? Um, it's on, it'll be on the website. It's always um, on the website as soon as I know. and. Sure, I, I didn't see anything on the website, so. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, um, well, I saw it this morning. It's been there for, since I think Wednesday. Oh, um, well, maybe I'm looking at the wrong place on the website. I'm, right I'm, uh, huh? I'm newer to Temecula and sort of looking around and I'm wondering, hmm, you know, is it gonna be something I might bring uh, my mom and 10 year old nephews to, or is this kind of gonna be more, you know, again, kind of a, yeah. Well, next Sunday is Easter, and mm -hmm. it, I, as let's see, I'm not the one planning it for next week. It is Grace, and I'm not sure some others that are planning it. But as I understand it, it's going to be presenting ideas uh, uh, from different perspectives, uh, Christian and pagan. Uh, and I'm not sure what else, different perspectives on this time of year. Yeah, um, that sounds good. I just, you know, I don't see anything on the website. It's yet. on the right hand side. Do you see the building on the home page? Uh huh. Do you see on the right hand side, there's a little block? That's where it says on mine. It says upcoming service. Right. I'm only seeing it for today. I'm not seeing. Yeah, I don't, you will not see any information about next week. Because oh, sure. My, my question was when we will be able to see kind of what's coming next week. Oh, like is it we'll a couple days before? Or? As soon as I have the information. information. <laughs> <laughs> because most so. of our speakers are volunteer speakers. And so I don't have, I very often don't have the information to put up ahead. And to, I will put it up as soon as I get the information to put up. Let's put it that yeah. way. I, I, I don't, I hope I don't come across as pushy or rude. So no, where's, where's the information? I'm, um, really excited to find this place, um, and I'm gonna just sort, sort of trying to decide. Okay, well, should I should I try to round up some family to come? You know, or is it maybe something that's more, I don't know, niche? You know, to people who are already kind of into, you know. Uh, no, I, I welcome your questions and welcome being able to answer why. I don't am not able to post them ahead of time. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, what, well, what's the take, you know, from people here about okay, I think a service like we just described is that something you might you know bring newcomers to, or is it yeah probably more yeah. familiar to people who are already in the tradition and stuff? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, I've I, I've been going to UU churches uh, for most of my life, uh, and I'm relatively new at at this at this church. Uh, so. Um, and I, I think that the services are meant to be accessible to people who aren't too intimately familiar with the details of UUism uh, and what and uh, and what that's about. And I'd say most um, this is a bit of a of a unique situation where we've had a sort of ongoing uh, topic for a few weeks now. And this was, uh, as our speaker Kathy mentioned, I think the third installation in a series on compassion. Uh, usually that's not the case. Usually they are uh, separate services, which uh, you wouldn't really necessarily need a whole lot of context. There isn't going to be a lot of lingo uh, thrown at you out of context. Uh, that's my experience anyway. And so in terms of the content, I'd say it's designed to be very accessible, uh, even if you're not very familiar with it.
Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Rachel, each week, this is Robert. Um, each week I send out a, what we call it a one minute guide, which is our weekly. And it has our upcoming service in it and any other upcoming events in the email. I just received your email from Dinah Rowe. So okay. I will be adding you to the list uh, Tuesday. So just check your email for one minute guide. And as soon as we get the information, I post, I email it out that way. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Rachel, also, um, I'm in Michigan, so it's kind of unique, but I was living in Sacramento and went to the Unitarian Church there, and I'm not familiar with whether this church has the same thing, but I do know that in general, UU churches have a lot of really good programs for young people. So outside of the service, you'd mentioned something about a younger person. and I, I agree with you that generally that's the case but we have no youth programming here okay well we we have had at various right. times right now but we don't but um right now since the closure we have zero yep. but i always said that once you get out of college you're probably never going to hear things like you will hear at a service here you know it, to me it's like a continuing education type thing what was your question, Rachel? What was that? Did you say? Oh, a question from a while back? Uh, I was just trying yeah. to figure out what the con... Huh? Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I was trying to figure out, oh, you know, should I round up and bring my mom and two 10-year-old nephews, or should I hold on and wait and, you know, see how you know, basic and newcomer-friendly it may be? Are you yeah. a TU or are you a UU person, or what are you? Um, uh, I've been to a couple... Uh, services and have some general familiarity. Uh, uh, so yeah. and next week will be our we. It is going to be, of course, Easter themed. So that may be uh, a good introductory service since it's going to be a topic which you you've heard of Easter before. Uh, <laughs> I presume. Um, so yeah, uh, and uh, so, so it'll it'll be in, and uh, and of course it'll be uh, on something that'll be familiar. So that might be a good. Uh, so that might be a good choice for an introductory. So have you have you dabbled in UU, or are you saying, or you've been a part of UU? I don't I don't understand. I've been to a celebration of life and a couple other things at a, a Unitarian church in Des Moines. Uh, I have a friend well, who's been a Unitarian, and so I've read like the Wikipedia, you know. So I would not say uh, I'm active. So but I have moved to Temecula. I'm looking for something like this. I don't feel like I fit into a traditional church very well. Right. So, um, so, and uh, this seemed uh, like a good choice. So. Yeah, so, so, so you, you the, the, there's different flavors of it, just depending upon where you go. But in general, mm -hmm. you go through like Buddhism, well, whatever, Christ, theoretically Christianity, theoretically. <laughs> but Bonnie is, never mind, that's not the point. Um, it's very diverse, lots of people from all different backgrounds. So like she said, like every time you go, it's like a college education. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I get that. I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to like, you know, um, so I have, you know, how to be an anti-racist and some other stuff on my shelf and I'm very into that. Yeah. Um, I just think, you know, maybe talking about interrogating uh, the you know, intersectionality of some concepts might be over the head of my 10 year olds, even though they're pretty bright. Well, well, it's, so it's very, it's, I was just trying to get a feel for what, you know. You use is very political as well. It's very political. Yeah. There's a lot of political yeah. stuff. So. Hey, Rachel, my name is Joan. I Hello. reach there. I'm, I'm, actually, um, I'm actually soon to be ordained as a UU minister. Congrats. Um, <laughs> My, that was my partner that gave the talk today. Um, if, if you want to, um, if you want to start an email conversation. I'm coming. Give me a sec. Oh, sorry. If you want to start an email conversation with me about this, um, about UUism in general, I would be cool. happy to have the conversation. I'll put, I'll put my uh, email address uh, in the chat. Do you have access to the chat? Yes, I do. Thanks. And, and, and I'll send you, you, know, so you Easter, know Easter at a UU was the very first service I went to in upstate New York. I'm in I'm in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts right now. But uh, the very first one I went to was Easter service, and look what happened. 
<laughs> Another thing you'll find, Rachel, is that the UUs tend to be, at least from my experience, they tend to be very open-minded. So the, they'll take almost literally any background, more or less. Like, as long as you're not like... Well, you can't just go into the church saying, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a white supremacist." <laughs> I, I, that's the only one they won't take. Other than Rachel, all, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, in terms of bringing younger uh, nibblings or childrens, um, I take I'm bringing my two year old, and my one year old next Sunday, so they'll and they'll be like in and out of paying attention, of course, but there it won't be like anything that's not. Um, interesting enough that they'll that they won't be uh like too over their heads it's not not a lecture hall situation yeah <laughs> and in terms of yeah and in terms of the seriousness of the topics and sort of the i, I would say this is on the upper end of how the sort of uh, kind of having a heady topic where it's a, a serious uh issue that 10 year olds don't really uh have the context to, to care about uh and uh and so this is definitely uh on the more intellectual side of the stuff we talk about. So um, it's gonna be more, uh, more, uh, not a, I guess just, a, it's not a, not usually so heady in terms of having to think hard about what Kathy, you're Kathy, thank you for the service. It was quite nice. I have to go, oh. but I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, I thank you. you guys. I didn't intend to Hi, Anna. take the discussion off the rails with my question. Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> I left Tucson about nine Thanks, years Hannah. ago, and I belonged to the Unitarian Church there, and uh, it expanded while I was there, and since then, they've outgrown the church, and uh, they're building a new church, and what's their secret? One of the things is they have a minister, so one thing that occurs to me is that um, we should hire on a minister and then say, well, we will pay you proportional to the population you can attract. And, <laughs> Whether that'll make a difference, I have no idea, but uh, it's a thought. Before well, we get off on to more of these other topics, we still have Kathy with us, and she won't be with us a whole lot longer. She's not going on to chat time, I'm sure. And if anybody has any questions or thoughts they want to talk about the sermon itself, this is the time to talk to Kathy, which if she were here in person, she would be mobbed by a couple of people <laughs> up at the dais, not letting her get into the coffee room to even talk to other people. That's what always happens. But here on chat time, we tend to wander. <laughs> so anybody want to talk to to Kathy about the service? Candy. Um, I was just wondering, the silo, is that like um, a symbol of protectionism? Or I was trying, I wasn't sure how the silo came into the discussion, I guess. Um, well, I, I realized that I was kind of behind the times in some of the um, the um, conversation um, around uh, racism and, and so, um, and I also um, was, the whole, the whole, um, Bonnie asked me to, to put some talks together and I had been working on, um, I don't, Rachel, I don't know if you had heard the first or the second one, but, um, okay. Um, but, um, I, after the last, during the last four years, I was like, kind of appalled at some of the lack of any kind of empathy or compassion for other people. And that ended up turning into a, a kind of a meditation. I found myself thinking about it. It's like, well, why is that the case? How can anybody feel that way, right? And so I um, didn't know that silos had been used actually uh, in the discussion around racism, but I knew that it was in business. And I thought, you know, to me, the metaphor seems very applicable to power structures being the silos and keeping information 
from um, getting out or um, um, uh, for uh, people who are making laws uh, to restrict other people's um, rights uh, and then not letting anybody know about it until, you know, let's say voting time and, you know, so mm -hmm. the silos are, are basically, um, they're power structures because typically the, the people, let's say in business are usually the CEOs and the, the high level management. And they have all kinds of information that never filters through to uh, the other employees and uh, or uh, make policies that they don't disseminate so that you're always like uh, as a, a lower level person on the hierarchy um, all of a sudden a policy has changed and you're getting in trouble for something and you're going well why is that well we changed the policy well does anybody else know that she changed the policy so I, I, I kind of saw that as, you know, how people make all kinds of decisions for other people and they uh, don't say anything until they want to enforce something. And also the people in power tend to be white men. Yeah, and, and it does most of the time uh, that white men are uh, in the higher up power, part of the power structure. And it was, you know, I was thinking about, well, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, does that kind of answer your question, Candace? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It does. Thank you. I um, have the privilege of calling her Candace, Candy instead of Candace because I'm her sister. <laughs> yes, I, I figured that. So, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to get too, too, uh, <laughs> Chummy, huh? <laughs> too chummy too soon, you know? <laughs> so, uh, no, very good discussion. Thank you. I mean, these things always make me nervous because I don't do a lot of it. Um, so, I know. Um, you got me to do one too, believe me, I know. I'm <laughs> <laughs> everybody. Uh, yeah, and I, I haven't had to get up in front of anybody since I graduated, and that was like four years ago. So I'm like, er. yeah. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so you can, if I'm not doing uh, the next one, Candace, you can be sure it's probably not going to be so. Um, uh, it, it, unaccessible to to younger folks that are going what you know so sure yeah um anything anything else anybody uh -huh. anybody can you hear me are you unmuted can you hear me yep yes, we're speaking. it's grace oh. and I'm, oh, on, I'm i'm using adam's laptop in the church oh um it, are you Hi, how are you? Thank you so um, much for your service. Camera. Thank you. Um, are you, am I echoing at all? No. No? Okay. Um, so what, um, what I found very interesting about today's sermon is um, how the theme again of interconnectedness <laughs> came up. Um, you were talking, what was it called? Um, uh, Inter Kathy? Um, intersectionality. Intersectionality, right. Um, and it just struck me as how our societies, our society is getting more and more complex. Um, there's a lot more layers when it comes to identity now. And um, it was very interesting how all aspects of our identities sort of overlap and define how we are discriminated or privileged. Um, so that was very interesting to me. Oh, yes. Well, I found I, I find that pretty interesting also. And, and um, um, I mean, like, for instance, um, I've been in the LGBTQ community since 1977. <laughs> and first, it was, you know, uh, like, if you were in school, the uh, <clears throat> 
the uh, organization were, was the Gay Student Union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the lesbians are going, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Does that right. mean we're included or <laughs> is this a boys club, mm -hmm. you know, and, right. and so as I, I, I've, I've marveled at how, like you said, uh, the m multiple layers and how much more complicated uh, identities, you know, how much more rich, well, let's put it that way, and, mm -hmm. and diverse uh, the different identities are. Um, and it makes, to me, it, it, it really does make it kind of hard to be able to go through all of, uh, like, uh, well, where you, you have to take the diff all of the different identities in and say, oh, okay, well, this, the discrimination looks like this for this, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the discri uh, discriminate, uh, you know, um, and um, it really, yeah, it's, it's, I find it very, very complex, but mm -hmm. I have, I have the, I have, uh, even sometimes, I, even though I look rather, uh, uh, it may seem jaded um, and um, um, but um, I really do have uh, hope that we can all um, nav start to learn how to navigate that so that everybody um, can come to the same table mm -hmm. so I guess by the way I, I, I love that you use uh, the uh, the hymn the closing hymn the endless song how can I keep from singing? That, that was very nice. Yeah, well, she likes that one a lot. Yeah. So. Thank you, Alex. Oh, can I say something? Thank you, a lucky guess. Yes, <laughs> Thomas. Hey, Alex. Um, you mentioned that book. Um, um, From Michael Lerner? Revolutionary Love, and we read that a few weeks ago in our um, book discussion group, and uh, oh. I was found it very frustrating, a lot of arm waving. and. Probably uh, um, engineer and me looks for practical steps to make things better. Like, uh, should we should we subsidize poor schools? Should we subsidize housing? So, how's a kid going to get a good grades if he doesn't have a place to study? And, uh, right. Say, that's that's my perspective. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I hadn't read it, and, and that's kind of the danger. But um, um, I, I, I don't know. I just thought it might uh, be a little bit more uplifting, uh, at least to, to. Well, it did me. I was because I was like, oh, what are we going to do about all of this? You know, and. Um, I had just finished a uh, compassionate integrity uh, training, and um, that's where some of the GDP information came from. And one of the things was, uh, well, um, the uh, Dalai Lama um, was part of putting, you know, uh, um, putting the class together and and use and some of the information that he had and um so there it's it's actually like three different units with uh with different other parts of of, of it through the training so when you start out you don't you start uh self-awareness and so you you go through the self uh, self-awareness and um, so that you are able to uh, learn what you see and, and maybe what you're blind to and different techniques about how to do that. So a lot of it's like different types of meditation and stuff. And then you work your way to the next one and then it's trying to understand other people. And um, the last thing is uh, systems 
and it they talk about the interdependentness of, of everybody so you they have you make a chart even if it's as simple as there's an apple um can you make a chart of everybody that had anything to do with that apple you know so you're looking at the farmers you're looking at who's handled it at the store you get, and all of a sudden this poor little apple <laughs> this wonderful apple has had like a hundred hands on it you know basically and it took about you know a lot of people to actually get that one apple to uh to your you know to your own house or something like that and I know I, I, I know that, but the when you chart it out, it starts to really dawn on you, just like uh, Grace was talking about how uh, how complex and layered things are, how really interdependent. If you didn't think that everybody was that everything was interdependent and was a web i mean it's like oh well that's even more so than than what i would have guessed and and so um i um anyway i i just thought the thought the thought of revolutionary love i mean i know that that's not really exactly uh new um but some of the stuff he he mentioned i thought was was things that we are having to think about again now and uh i just yeah. thought it might be a little bit more uplifting <laughs> no I, I i like the idea of interdependence that was a that's a good insight um very interesting because there's two ideas, one that's dependent and one that's independent, and both are incomplete. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to draw this to a close at this point. We are, we are running over time to go to chat time, and then we have a board meeting today. So oh. we've got a lot of things going on. And when we are live and in person, we could have chat time and this go on simultaneously. But our, our uh, Zoom won't allow us to do that for some reason. We can't have both going on at the same time. So uh, thank, I want to thank everybody again for, for mm -hmm. it was a privilege. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope you're doing well, Bonnie. <laughs> and just for the rest of your knowledge, um, Kathy, uh, Kathy's partner, uh, Joan, is a speaker here once a month. So we will, we will see Joan again soon. <laughs> we have completely different styles. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're and she's had a lot more training than I. <laughs> well, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> when Kathy reads Jones' talk, which we had. <laughs> see, you see, when when she speaks, I'm her.